the greatest fantasy, to my mind, is distinguished by its settings. The setting becomes almost a character. Middle Earth becomes a real place and becomes a character. The Shire, Rivendell, um, Minas Tirith, um, Mordor, each of these is very vivid and real. And I tried to do the same with, uh, with uh, my own Westeros. Everybody loves a bit of world building, or at least I do. It's interesting. It's something to get lost in. It's fascinating how real these worlds can end up genuinely feeling to us. What they can also be, however, is very daunting, and that can mean a world so vast in a set of novels that you might struggle or not even bother to get into it. Or it can mean, oh my gods, I wanted to invent my own fictional world, but there's so much to do, I don't even know where to begin, I feel lost. <laughs> So yeah, this video isn't really a guide for how to get going in world building exactly. Once upon a time I made a video called 8 Things Writers Forget When World Building, which is probably closer to a sort of guide if you're interested in that. This video is more specific and I wanted to take a look at George R. R. Martin's world building extravaganza that is A Song of Ice and Fire slash Game of Thrones slash House of the Dragon, all, all of that, you know. Um, what makes his world building so effective? What can we learn from that? And in a way, you could scream out a very obvious answer to that question. His world building is effective because it's so massively detailed. There's so much to get lost in. But again, that's not an entire answer, you know, because too much information can run the risk of making a world boring. Also, detail doesn't necessarily make a world feel genuine alive to us that's slightly different that's the trick I guess making a load of information feel alive like um, the trick of a painting feeling 3d or some sort of better analogy than that um, I thought today I'd take off my therapist hat and put on my, my writer's one I guess to set out five key aspects that I think makes George R. R. Martin's world building really sing there are no doubt more aspects that you could add in the comments, these are just five key ones that stood out to me and I don't think always get discussed enough, so let's just get going. This one's a pretty short, simple point to begin with. To really make a culture stand out, you need to have it in some way clash with other cultures. It doesn't have to be massive. George R. R. Martin delivers tons of different cultures and languages and all sorts that obviously create very clear contrasts, but I don't think anyone needs me to point out having different languages and climates and things obviously makes the world feel more real. The point I think is making sure these different cultures rub up against one another. And some Sometimes that can be in the very small or more grounded differences, like you get a lot of different characters in the stories either complaining about Dornish wine compared to other drinks or praising it as so much better. Whatever character wants a drink, all there is at hand is Dornish wine and they have an opinion on this. That adds something, you know? So does actually Dawn having slightly different laws of succession, which changes how characters think about Marcella Baratheon in the books. I think the best example is the Ironborn. It's not not enough to know they do all these sorts of things very differently to the rest of Westeros. They have their iron price concepts, they have a sea stone chair and king's mood and things that other areas of Westeros don't do. You know, that's all great. These are very different cultural things to other places, but it's the added emotional punch we get from what these Ironborn think about other parts of Westeros, how they want to be different, want to set themselves apart. In the same way, how others tend to look down on the Ironborn for various reasons. To some very small extent, I guess what culture is, is a certain group of people saying, we're not like these other people, let's accentuate what makes us different. And the kind of conflicts you get there, that's useful to really highlight and make the most of. And through the character of Fionn Greyjoy, an ironborn who was taken away as a ward to live in Winterfell, we get a wonderful insight into this conflict between two different cultures and two different upbringings. That's what really makes it feel vivid. 
This video is sponsored by World Anvil. I know I rarely do sponsors, but this is one I am really excited about because World Anvil is really cool. World Anvil is an online tool for world building, campaign building, character creation, management, good for writers, game masters, and participants of said games from Dungeons and Dragons to all these other ones I haven't heard of. Oh, I do know some of them actually, but I said world building can feel daunting when there's so much to do. World Anvil makes a massive difference, giving you all the tools and features you could possibly need. A lot of different features. The one I find the most fun though is their Chronicles feature. Say you want to design your own calendar for your world, you can pop in all the information, have the calendar generated, then build a timeline of historical events linked to that calendar or several calendars with all sorts of hyperlinks you might want sprawling to other articles, and then upload a map and link different events to locations on the map so you can easily see where and when everything happened. I find that so handy and if the timeline affects how the map looks such as a big city getting destroyed or whatever else you can add altered maps to reflect those changes. Plus you can have different timelines running together. <laughs> there, are, there are other features to World Anvil too I just get a bit excited about that one specifically because my organization is chaotic at best and a good five years ago I tried to plot out this stuff with my own calendar and timelines for my novel on paper and I got in a complete muddle and something like this is just perfect for me. So yeah, I have a link in the description and as a pinned comment with the code TREE which will offer you 40% off all their yearly subscriptions. You know, we're coming up to Christmas, that could make one hell of a Christmas present if not for yourself. So check the link. World Anvil is seriously really good and you can tell it's made by people who are passionate right down to touches like this. Look at that. <laughs> now back to the video. Or, you know, we get a lot about how southerners look on the north as full of stubborn people too set in their ways and too tied to loyalty, which might not always be the exact truth, but it's what people feel and that means something, that adds a bit of extra, you know? Stannis is frustrated by these people in his ventures up north. In A Game of Thrones, as in the first book rather than the show, um, how out of place Ned, Stark and Sansa and Arya feel when they go down south to King's Landing. The contrast they feel, I think, makes it more real. Which I think is also amplified in that first book in how Winterfell feels like this safe, sheltered, slightly innocent home to the Stark children, where the South, in contrast, feels so dangerous and brutal and uncertain. That's a separate point I was going to touch on later, actually, um, but if you can tie theme to different aspects of your world building. That will make it feel twice as impactful to the reader. The North, at least initially, or Winterfell, feeling like this safe world, how we as a reader sort of journey outwards to these other places and it becomes less innocent. That theme only mostly runs through the first book, but it helps you it helps you grow accustomed to the differences of these cultures in a more engaging way, I think. So yeah, I guess that's two points now. One, make a culture feel more real by having it not just contrasted, but actually rubbing up against other cultures. And two, tie theme to aspects of your world. I'll probably still touch on that point later on though. This point is less straightforward and in some ways quite specific to these books. And it's to say that I find it interesting that the books begin, I think, 15 odd years after this massive event of Robert's Rebellion. A colossal, fascinating war alongside the Greyjoy Rebellion, which overshadows pretty much everything in the books to begin with. So much so you could kind of feel like the book should have began with that event, not all these years after it, but no, we need that history in the past before the story begins. Having history of course adds layers to your world, but what we see here is also much more than just that, I think, and I'm going to split it into two separate points to illustrate it. The first is that history is never clear, it's messy and uncertain, and nobody properly knows what happened or why it happened. But I sometimes think you get fantasy stories where they make the mistake of having historical events of their world just these clear things that everybody knows for a fact what happened and everybody agrees on why it happened and what it led to and whether it was good or bad. But in terms of Robert's Rebellion, was it caused by Aerys' brutality and paranoia? 
especially in his murder of Brandon and Rickard Stark, or was it caused by Rhaegar taking away Lyanna, or Jon Arryn choosing to refuse the king and call his banners? And there's all sorts of sub-questions to each of those questions, and there's also why did Robert's side win the war? Was it just Robert being able to defeat Rhaegar in combat? If so, would it have happened if Arthur Dane and some of the other Kingsguard had been present? If so, then why weren't they present? Was it Tywin Lannister choosing to turn on Ares? Did that make the difference? If so, did he do that for purely political reasons, or was it motivated by Aerys' scorn of him earlier on? Whatever other questions, all sorts of them that you get to hear lots of characters differing opinions on. It's that uncertainty and conflict, an element of mystery that really elevates the history here. So, in crafting the history of your world, you need to plot out not just what happened, but what people believe happened, why they think it happened, and then also what they think about the fact it happened, I guess. And in the second point, which is the one I find most fun, this big event which is drawn on so much in the story did only happen 15 odd years ago, and the Grey Drury Rebellion even less. What that means is that it's history lots of the characters we encounter in this story remember firsthand and have very personal feelings about. Sometimes you get fantasy stories where where different factions hate each other based on things that happened hundreds of years ago, long before any of the people alive remember them. And not only does it make me wonder, surely their cultures could have moved on and developed different conflicts and repaired and resolved differences by now, but I also feel like you then don't get any personal connection to these events because there's no one who firsthand feels them, there's no one who lost people in that battle, who remembers them, who has certain regrets and fears and griefs and fulfilments from that event. The point here is not just what do people think about the history, but how do they personally personally feel about it? How has it shaped them and their culture? A lot of our understanding of Robert's rebellion comes out of Robert's own grief for Lyanna, his still burning hatred for all things Targaryen, or Viserys feeling he has lost his birthright to an evil usurper. How Ned Stark's memories of his friend Robert are set against the man he has become, Sir Barristan's regrets about saving King Aerys from imprisonment, regrets about not being able to save Rhaegar, Jaime's conflicting feelings around murdering the king, this rebellion never feels like isolated history thrown in for the sake of world building, precisely because the event matters so integrally to most of the characters we encounter. To understand who Robert is as a character, or Ned Stark, or Stannis, you need to understand the rebellion and how it affected them. Even secondhand, with Daenerys or Jon Snow, would they be the characters we are coming to know if it wasn't for this event? So I'd say that, you don't necessarily need to plot out every intricate moment of your world's past conflicts and events and know like wars down to the most minute new details, but you do need to be sure what people think and feel and how they were affected by these events. Everything we learn of Robert's Rebellion and the Greyjoy Rebellion comes from people's personal memories of it, and as a result, I think it resonates on a much deeper level. This one is a point I don't always like because there are definitely stories where it can feel forced, but it's also undeniably effective when it's appropriate. Symbols and banners isn't the right name for this really, by banners I just mean the world giving you something clear cut and ordered, even if it's very loose and contradictory, that can appear to divide up the world easily. Westeros is kind of divided up by these different holds, each with the great houses, Stark, Lannister, Arryn, Tully, Greyjoy, Tyrell, Baratheon, Martell. You can know who the lords of each of these houses are, you can know where they are based, what their banner looks like and what their house words are. Obviously there are other houses and other places beyond Westeros but it's something very vivid and clear for new readers to easily wrap their heads around. Simple to explain and comes with clear visual differences, it also gives you a good sense of the map of Westeros. And the same principle goes for other stories too, like uh, Avatar The Last Airbender has air, water, earth and fire nations, each with distinct colours and fighting styles. Harry Potter has Gryffindor, Slytherin, Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw, again with their own visuals and some sense of them representing 
personalities, I suppose. It's like someone could easily put this stuff into a diagram or on cue cards so that you can then see and go, okay, I understand this world now, you know? As I say, this kind of thing isn't appropriate for all stories. I absolutely hate the arbitrary ways the world is divided up in the Divergent series. It feels so forced and stupid. Although I did only see the movie for that, and that was a long time ago, so don't hold me to that criticism. The house divisions of Harry Potter feel unnecessarily rigid at times. Why are basically all Slytherins bad people? Why is it so rare for students of different houses to be close friends? Why is everyone so obsessed with the house cup? I would not have given a shit if I was at Hogwarts about who won. Some of the rigid aspects of these house divisions would be fine provided characters in the story also acknowledged how stupid the divisions were and could poke fun at it a little as this very antiquated Hogwarts tradition that has its problems but we rarely get that stuff in Harry Potter where we do get it in A Song of Ice and Fire I think. We get all these cool houses we can easily understand and probably engage in all sorts of online discussions about which we relate to the most or which is our favourite but we also see the books somewhat exploring what these houses actually mean. Does loyalty to a specific house make any sense in the world, yes and no, do the common folk care, not particularly. The divisions don't have to be just things like houses either, they can be represented through different locations, which is why maps can be so useful, or different races, or factions, or parts of a city, or um, <laughs> different sports teams. Whatever it is, something that can stand out a little clearer and make the world easier to get your head around in those early stages. Next, let's talk about magic. I'll keep this point short because I already sort of accidentally explained half of it earlier on. Um, Adding theme to aspects of the actual world building itself can make it twice as engaging. Not necessarily more realistic, no, although sometimes. Um, either way, the point isn't necessarily to make a world that feels 100% realistic in world building. The aim is to make one that feels alive, which is sort of to do with realistic, but also not the same. Something I talked about in my video on House of the Dragon was that a big part of what made the dragons work so well there, where in Game of Thrones they felt a bit flat and often like generic plot devices. Wasn't just wasn't just that they were animated or given some but not too much character or how they had actual impact on the plot, but it was that they seemed to properly express or explore thematic points. What I'm trying to say is season one of that show feels like this mighty family of the Targaryens slowly becoming dwarfed by the even mightier force of nature that is their own dragons. Dragons who prove unpredictable and eventually not always controllable. As much as people strive to gain power, it may then take on a life of its own beyond your control, and the dragons feel like a great symbol to express that in the story. A thematic arc, I guess. Uh, that doesn't make the world any more realistic there, no, but it does just give the idea of dragons an extra punch that, even if you're not consciously aware of this thematic idea, you'll still feel a level of weight to them, I think. The same way the One Ring in Tolkien's work expresses and explores all sorts of its own ideas about power and about good and evil that gives it a lot of weight. The elves, I guess, kind of touch on divinity or something angelic. The Shire and the Hobbits touch on all that Tolkien felt was best about this green and pleasant land, you know? You can feed those kind of explorations into the actual world building itself, even if it is very minor and very loose and very faint that's fine. And that applies to magic as much as dragons in A Song of Ice and Fire. Magic has all this dark feel, these concerns about whether it is good to be meddling with such powers. Prophecies that are so easily misinterpreted and so readily lead to disaster. Since I've touched on Harry Potter already, I feel like a lot of the magic there is a bit flat for this exact reason. There isn't much thematic weight to it. Patronuses, however, they have this general sense of finding joy in the face of depression, or occlumency as some sort of emotional discipline, I guess. They carry some weight, not just because you understand how the spells work, but they're expressing something meaningful. There's 
the level of metaphor there, I guess. It seems so obvious saying it like that. Of course theme elevates a story, of course theme is needed, but it's important in the world building itself as well. One of my favourite examples is the Alephiometer from his Dark Materials. It feels far less just like some magical artefact that Lyra has to learn to use than it does like a genuine spiritual philosophy that we get to grapple with. That adds so much more to the story and to the world, but um, let's move on to point five before I start repeating myself too much here. Tone is obvious, but easy to overlook. This is what I think really makes A Song of Ice and Fire so engrossing. It feels like its own world separate from other ones, a world where uh, people swear and <laughs> talk endlessly about sex and do lots of horrible, brutal things all of the time. A world where politics is confused and complex and so is magic and war and history and everything. A world where common folk suffer for the games the highborn play and there are these gothic-like threats of white walkers beyond the wall. I don't know, tone is hard to explain, but when a world comes together it feels incredibly strong. And there are other things that add distinct tone, all this stuff about different houses and their banners for one, uh, the Lovecraftian feel you get to a lot of the farther reaches of this world, the way they all speak and the way they say name day instead of birthday or spell sir with an e or names are spelt or changed slightly from the ordinary English ones. Some of that can be a bit annoying, and it does annoy me at times. Uh, there is a fine line to balance there, but it can make the world feel different to real life. The biggest thing, though, in my opinion, is actually Robert's Rebellion. We're coming back to that again. This past event that people have all these conflicting memories of. Everything about Robert's Rebellion comes with a feel that the best is long gone, that an age more like the typical romanticised tales of Arthurian knights and chivalry and everything else else, that the time of those things has passed by and the world left behind in its wake feels far more brutal and empty without it. Concepts like honour somehow meet a swift beheading, even though Rhaegar is 100% a flawed person, you get this sort of feel that if only he had just become king. It conjures up a world that feels faintly nostalgic and in search of a purpose just in its very culture, and that's really powerful. That's why so much emphasis is placed on people remembering Robert's Rebellion. It expresses so much feeling about the past and knights and what if chivalry and honour and oaths are dead. We are presented not just with characters but with a world itself kind of caught in existential crises between finding belief in old ideals or having to search for something new and the tone that creates. It's that general feeling to the world you get lost in more than anything else. So. Yeah, again, it's obvious, it's so airy and abstract that it's hard to talk about with any precision, but tone matters. And that's the video. <laughs> um, just highlighting some of the aspects that I found made George R. R. Martin's world building work so well. Let me know what other aspects I missed, let me know how these points don't necessarily work for other types of stories or other worlds, let me know if I got anything wrong or could have gone further. And if you liked it, give the video a like, subscribe for more stuff, support me on Patreon for even more stuff, and a big thank you to World Anvil again, check the link in the description and the comments, but otherwise, hopefully see you next time. And as ever, a special thank you goes to Janice McMahon, Blue Core, Treat You Caber, Michael Gallagher, InSquares, Flying Spider, Samara Salsi, Joshua C. Folliere, and Chad Bramwell. Thank you.